The first launch of the SLS rocket has finally happened. Unfortunately, it appears as though its mobile launch platform sustained more damage than anticipated. What steps will SpaceX take to prevent a similar situation with Starship's first flights? Plus, updates on SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, Blue Origin's Exploration Park campus, and other developments around Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. Let's get right into it, but first, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. More about them later. Starting off with the historic first launch of SLS. Launchpad 39B finally saw its first launch since Ares 1X lifted off from the former shuttle pad in 2009. Famously, during the Ares 1X launch, 39B took quite a beating, and this first launch of SLS appears to be similar, if not worse, for the mobile launcher. A good amount of damage has been noted, although not seen in detail due to ITAR restrictions on close up photography of the umbilicals. Luckily, Everything appears to have worked as planned during liftoff, and there will be plenty of time for repairs before Artemis 2, which is currently scheduled for mid-2024. If you want to count down the days to Artemis 2, make sure you get one of the NASA spaceflight calendars, at least for 2023. They're available now at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Workers are continuing to safe the mobile launcher ahead of its rollback from 39B atop the crawler transporter. With Starship, SpaceX wants to rapidly reuse both vehicles and launch infrastructure. So, what might be done in order to make that happen? Well, right off the bat, not using solid rocket boosters certainly helps, as this shockwave visible at SRB ignition could in fact have been the cause for some of the damage. Next, we might get a small clue with the recent release by SpaceX of drainage plans for the Starship launch pad at 39A that were discovered by our friend Harry Stranger. In previous flyovers, we've noted the unique water deluge ring that was installed at the base of the launch mount. Perhaps part of SpaceX's answer could include the use of a large amount of water to absorb the energy of 33 Raptor engines pushing a Starship stack off the pad. We'll touch on these plants more in just a bit. Ultimately though, SpaceX will need to take into account the proximity of 39A's Starship and Falcon pads, as the launch of a Starship disrupting SpaceX's ability to launch crew or payloads would not be okay for either program. Elsewhere at 39A, the LOX tank inner shell now has a dome and pipes that have been added to it. Scaffolding has been removed from the tank as welds are likely now complete. The drawworks for the Starship tower can be seen next to it. The drawworks consist of the machinery and cabling used to hoist the chopsticks and starships up and down. Fun fact, the machinery came from one of the oil rigs purchased by SpaceX in order to study the construction of floating launch and landing starship pads. Next, the suspected water tank to the north is now all painted black and pipes are being laid out to the south of it. Maybe we'll see a way for this potential water to be pumped to the new Starship pad for the deluge system we mentioned a few moments ago. We'll see, but something that we do know will contain water are the new sets of ponds that SpaceX is planning on building or modifying at 39A. Back to that set of documents pertaining to the drainage systems at LC-39A, we can see some details of the ponds to be built or modified, as well as the outline of the new facilities being built at 39A. If you're wondering, prop doesn't mean propellant. It actually means proposed. We kind of fell for that a few months ago with similar documents for Roberts Road until we realized proposed made much more sense. If you're wondering why there isn't more water storage under construction at 39A, perhaps these ponds are part of the story. At the Falcon 9 pad at 39A, the TE is not visible as it was rolled back to the HIF for rocket integration for the CRS-26 mission. Liftoff is scheduled for November 22nd. A Falcon Heavy side booster from USS F-44 is waiting to enter the hangar outside its main door. Judging by the soot marks, it appears it is B-1064, which landed on LZ-1. The booster had been sitting at the complex during the previous weeks, and it is now finally being processed for the next flight, USS F-67, currently scheduled for no earlier than January 2023. Let's fly over now to Slick 40. The Falcon 9 slated to launch UTELSAT-10B was vertical and without payload ahead of its static fire test. 
The booster used, B1049, will be launching for an 11th and final flight. As you can see, the interstage is not the traditional black interstage we've grown accustomed to on Falcon 9 Block 5 boosters. The interstage from 1049 is instead living on as part of B1052. Moving on to SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, we can see that there are now four new tower sections built with a fifth under construction and parts for a sixth already next to it. Right now, there isn't a way to tell which section goes where on the tower, except for the first one that was built. We can see the stop or resting point for the chopsticks on this section, indicating it is the bottom or first tower segment. Also at the tower construction area, there are concrete foundations visible for the assembly of two additional tower sections. It's unclear why these have been added, but there are a few possible reasons. The first being that they're abandoning two of the other sets of foundations and using these instead. The second potential reason is that this new tower will be two sections taller than the first two Starship launch towers, though we haven't heard any rumblings to that effect. The final potential reason, at least that we can think of right now, is that SpaceX plans to build yet another tower at the Cape. Where will all these towers go? Nobody knows. We'll just have to keep our eyes open and ears to the ground to find out. But in the meantime, let us know in the comments, what do you think is going on here? Moving on now to the chopstick construction area, the rail system that is used to adjust the location of ships and boosters when lifting or catching has already been installed. Next door to the chopsticks, there's the tip of the quick disconnect arm where the actual ship QD will rest. This tip has an access walkway for workers to be able to access the umbilicals and connections for the ship. Next to the chopsticks is their carriage system. Elsewhere at Roberts Road, Star Factory construction continues. It has now reached the south end of the foundations that have been built. More walls have been installed, and while most of the building has an upward slope to the south, the last portion is even taller, featuring two different heights than the rest of the building. Perhaps this is where nose cones will be constructed. Over at the Mega Bay, progress appears to have stalled. There's been no developments at all other than some beams and sections moved around. Why is that? Well, it could be that they're missing a construction permit and can't begin yet, or maybe they're missing a key component or something like that. Maybe they're just reviewing the design. Whatever the reason, it means it will still be longer until starships can be built in Florida. At Hangar X, a delivery truck can be seen at the entrance with a cylindrical object in black wrap. Zooming in on it, we can see that it has the right size for it to be the interstage of a Falcon booster. Paying closer attention, we can see a bulge in the middle that indicates this interstage is for a Falcon Heavy center core. This is the location where the side booster longerons are secured after separation and retraction. Over at the port, Just Read the Instructions is getting some new paint on its X and a shortfall of Gravitas is undergoing maintenance, likely taking advantage of the downtime with all the expendable launches and return to launch site landings like Hakuto R and OneWeb1 One later this month. Bob was the only one in a pair of fairing recovery vessels that remained in port, as Doug left for fairing recovery support for UTELSAT 10B. At Blue Origin's Exploration Park campus, there has been a lot of progress on the southern end of the site. The warehouse expansion is now gaining a roof, and some pre-assembled segments sit waiting to be lifted in place. The Reef Pathfinder building now has a clear layout for where its foundations will be built. The name of this building leads us to believe that it will be used to construct Pathfinder hardware for Orbital Reef, Blue Origin's private space station. Just to the north of the Reef Pathfinder building, we can see the foundation for the vertical assembly area making good progress since our last flyover. It's not overly clear what this area will be used for just yet, but over time, we should be able to piece together the purpose of this facility. Heading up to the northern end of Blue's campus, the finishing touches are still being made around the 2CAT facility. Some groundwork is being completed to the rear of the building, as well as retention basins being dug alongside the road to the north. As a reminder, the 2CAT is where Blue will clean and test the New Glenn upper stages before flight. Lastly, check out this cool transport stand for the large New Glen payload fairing halves. This would be used to safely move the fairing halves around the facility as needed. 
At Launch Complex 36, Blue Origin's orbital launch site for New Glenn, there are no major changes since our last flight. However, the one main thing to note is that the ground support equipment storage tent at the base of the ramp is now covered. Hopefully, we'll see more movement out of the pad soon, as we expect to see the new Glenn Pathfinder roll out onto the pad and raised vertical soon. Looking at Relativity's Launch Complex 16, there are some cranes working on the launch pad, but all the interesting operations are currently taking place inside of the hangar. On November 18th, Relativity tweeted out that, quote, Terran 1 stage mate ops are complete showing the full Terran-1 rocket assembled inside of the hangar. With the speed that Relativity are moving, we hope to see the Terran-1 back out on the launch pad in the coming weeks, and hopefully a launch soon after. Up at the launch and landing facility, or as I still call it the shuttle landing facility, Space Florida recently submitted permits for their Project Comet, which will be a payload processing facility for an unnamed company. This 104,000 square foot building will be constructed on sites A and O of the Block 3 expansion. This is some of the area where Terran Orbital were planning to build their satellite manufacturing campus until they recently announced they were focusing on their operations in California. Hopefully, we will see some progress here as Space Florida boosts the commercial industrial expansion at this historic location. Speaking of expansion, I'd like to expand the cast of narrators on this flyover to our friend Jack, so he can tell us about this video sponsor, Brilliant. Thanks, Sawyer, and thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. We couldn't do these flyovers without them. If you want to learn STEM topics interactively and at your own pace, then Brilliant is the tool for you. If you're anything like me, you learn best from hands-on experience. With Brilliant, you get fun and interactive lessons in all kinds of STEM topics that help you learn more effectively than just by watching or reading something online. Brilliant lets people access college-level information without having to attend a four-year school or spend a bunch of money. Whether you want to deep dive into coding or to just brush up on everyday math, Brilliant has a course for you, and new courses are added monthly. Speaking of new courses, Brilliant just added the Introduction to Algebra course, which, given my grades back in middle and high school, I should really start taking immediately. Even for topics that seem daunting, as math does for me, learning a little bit every day can add up over time and help you expand your knowledge base and comfort level with all manner of concepts. Get started learning on Brilliant for free today with a special offer just for our viewers. Visit brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or click the link in the description. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Learn by doing and help the world become a better place by adding to the number of smart people in it. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Back to you, Sawyer. Thanks, Jack. All right, that's it for this flyover. If you enjoyed it, make sure you're subscribed so that you know when we post our next one. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.